everyone, this is Monaro and welcome to my channel. We have finally reached the end of this reread project. I want to thank everyone for their patience. So without further ado, we are going to go over chapters 66 to 72. Hope you enjoy. Tyrion has made an agreement with Ben Plum to join the Second Sons. He signs a number of agreements that he will pay about 50 higher ranking members of the company 100 gold dragons. This amount increases for the higher ranking officers and for Plum himself. He must sign a contract for 100,000 dragons along with land and a lordship. After this, he signs the register for the second sons using his own blood as ink. After this, he is told to go and find armor for himself and Penny. He returns to where she is sleeping, and there he notices signs that she may have the bloody flux. Regardless, she is distraught over the abandonment of the hog and the dog that were part of her show. Tyrion is hiding from her that the two animals have almost definitely been slaughtered by Yazen Zokaga's men. While they are looking for armor, they find Jorah Mormont outfitted in a random assortment of armor, which he claims is of decent quality. When Penny tells Tyrion that she dreamt that she was jousting with her brother again, Tyrion slaps her, trying to force her to quit her mooning and to realize that they must wear armor or likely die. Finally, Tyrion says that he will take care of making sure that the second sons turn sides again since Tyrion and Jorah both agree that they are on the losing side of the coming battle. Sir Barristan meets with Skahaz Mokandak again, and they go through with their plan to seize Hisdar and the city and have it ruled by a council until Daenerys' return. They decide that their word for going ahead with the plan will be Grolio, in reference to the hostage that was slain by the Yunkai. Skahaz reveals that he was present in the throne room when Bloodbeard and the Slaver Lords made their insult, and that he and every one of the brazen beasts present would have killed the Yunkish delegation in an instant had Hisdar given the command, raging that the Yunkish would never have dared do such a thing to Daenerys. The Shafebait goes on to explain to Sir Barristan that Hisdar's horrified reaction to Grolio's severed head was a sham and the slavers couldn't care less about Yurkaz Zoyangzak's death in the pit. The whole thing was arranged so as to give Hisdar a pretext to kill the queen's dragons before Volantis's fleet arrive. Despite Skaha's objection, Barristan insists that after Hisdar is deposed, they will order the Yunkai return their remaining hostage and withdraw their armies from Marine, only going forth to do battle if they refuse. Selmy is also confident he can overcome his Dar's guards as they are only pit fighters and Barristan believes men like that who fight for adulation of the crowd and only when they are called to are no match for a knight of the king's guard who must always be alert and ready to fight and die at a moment's notice to defend their monarch. Barristan and Skahaz also dispute over trying to rescue the remaining hostages, Jogo, Hero, and Dario, as the Shafepate believes it is too dangerous to try. He is also particularly scathing about Dario, believing it would be better in the long run for Daenerys if the Stormcrow's captain were to die. Though he is aware Daenerys is in love with Dario, Barristan privately agrees as he is well aware from the history that the Targaryens have a propensity for choosing poorly in matters of the heart, choices that almost always lead to disaster. Prince Rhaegar loved his Lady Lyanna and thousands died for it. Daemon Blackfire loved the first Daenerys and rose in rebellion when denied her. Bitterstill and Bloodraven both loved Shiera Seastar and the Seven Kingdoms bled. The Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstones so much he cast aside a crown and Westeros paid the bride price in corpses. All three of the sons of the fifth Aegon had wed for love 
in defiance of their father's wishes. And because that unlikely monarch had followed his heart when he chose his queen, he allowed his sons to have their way, making bitter enemies when he might have made fast friends. Treason and turmoil followed as night follows day, ending at summer hall in sorcery, fire, and grief. Skahas also mentions that they have hostages of their own and that they can easily retaliate in kind if the Yunkai harm any more of their hostages. But like his queen, Barristan refuses to harm the cupbearers due to his own aversion to killing children. Though disappointed, the shave pate agrees and promises that everything will be ready for the plan by nightfall. For the rest of the day, Barristan makes his rounds about the pyramid and trains with his boys. He thinks to himself that some of them might be ready for knighthood soon. However, as he wrestles with what he is planning to do that night, he decides it would be worse for the boys if they were knighted by a knight without honor just before his death. He lectures the boys about honor and thinks that someday maybe they will understand. He also warns Missandei not to leave the queen's chambers, but refuses to answer her questions about his intentions. He also reflects on his own failures, one in particular, that he didn't defeat Rhaegar at the tourney at Harrenhal. Had he won, he would have crowned a Shara Dane, who he was enamored with as queen of love and beauty, and wonders that if he had, would a Shara not have killed herself from grief over a child supposedly fathered on her by a Stark? Barristan considers that his greatest failure. During the night, after bathing and donning his armor, Sir Barristan goes to confront his dar in his chambers. The brazen beast let him pass without incident. Barristan, using the pretext of delivering a message to gain entrance, tries to question Hisdar, demanding to know if he is in league with the Sons of the Harpy, and if he had anything to do with the assassination attempt on Daenerys. Hisdar's denials of the accusation do not convince Selmy, and when the old knight draws his sword, Hisdar calls for the pit fighter Kraz, one of his guards to defend him. Despite Barristan's efforts to convince Kraz to surrender, the pit fighter attacks him. However, Kraz's inexperience of fighting opponents wearing armor is his downfall, and Selmy kills him quickly. Barristan tells Hisdar, who desperately begs for his life, that he means to take Hisdar to a cell where he will be imprisoned until Daenerys returns. Suddenly, a cupbearer informs them that Resnak wishes to see the king. Barristan, surprised as he and Skahas had planned to imprison Resnak as well, asks why and is told the dragons Viserion and Rhaegal have been loosed upon the city. Quentin goes ahead with his plan to steal the dragons. With the help of the windblown company, they make it to the pit where Rhaegal and Viserion are kept. There, however, they use the code word dog on the brazen beasts, who are actually part of the scheme to overthrow the king that very night. A fight ensues, and the four guards are slain, although Quentin is almost slain by a spear. They enter and find that Rhaegal has also broken his chains since he was last in the pit, and that Viserion has created a cave for himself in the ceiling of the pit. Viserion is first attracted to pretty Maris, as he is looking for Daenerys, but then he tries to exit the pit. Throughout this encounter, Quentin tries to dominate the dragons like he had seen Daenerys do with Drogon, but when he strikes Viserion with a whip, Rhaegal spews fire on him, setting him aflame. John means to lead men to Hardhome to rescue the wildlings and men of the Night's Watch trapped there. Queen Selyse and Melisandre discourage him and want to leave them to their fate. However, John is determined to lead a rescue mission. While planning the mission with Tormund Giantsbane, John receives a letter from Ramsay Bolton. Ramsay claims that King Stannis is dead after a seven-day battle 
that he captured Mance Raider and flayed his spear wives, and that he wants his bride back, along with Theon, Melisandre, Val, Mance's presumed son, and Queen Selyse and her daughter. This changes everything, and John decides to send the bulk of the Night's Watch to Hardhome with Tormund in command, while he will go to Winterfell himself and make Ramsay answer for his words. John knows that doing so will break his vow to not interfere in the wars of the Seven Kingdoms, so he's prepared to go alone. He asks if anyone will ride with him and gets an overwhelming roar of support from most of the wildlings, though not from his black brothers. Yarwick and Bowen Marsh leave the hall with their men. John doesn't mind as he appears to have more than enough men to go with him, and none of the Night's Watch will have to break their vows. When John is on his way to inform Queen Selyse, he hears the giant one one roar and a man scream. When he arrives, a bleeding one one is smashing dead Sir Patrick against a tower wall. John tries to calm the people who come running when Wick Whittlestick slashes at John's throat with a dagger, just barely grazing him. While John is still trying to understand, Bowen Marsh and others plant daggers in him, all of them saying, for the watch. By the time the fourth dagger slashes him, John passes out. It is raining heavily in Marine, for which Barristan Selmy is grateful. Otherwise, the fires caused during Viserion and Rhaegal's rampage might have consumed the entire city. There is no sign of the two dragons. They do not like the rain any more than men. Quentin Martell is dead. It took him three days to die. Out of respect for the prince, Sir Barristan had him placed in the queen's bed, the same one he crossed half the world to reach. Missandei is the only one he could get to tend to Quentin, for none of the cupbearers were willing and the Blue Graces never responded to his summons. He suspects the Pale Mare has carried them off. Missande asks what is to be done with Quentin's body, and Barristan replies that they will find a way to send him back to Dorne, though he is unsure how. He advises Missande to get some sleep, and she urges him to do the same, as she has noticed that he doesn't sleep very much. Barristan privately thinks it is not just needing less sleep than a younger man, as Grand Maester Parcel once told him, but having reached the age where he fears to close his eyes in case he never opens them again. Barristan does not consider dying in his sleep a death worthy of a knight of the King's Guard. For a brief moment, he wonders if Daenerys is dead, but then dismisses the thought, though he knows that each time it becomes harder to convince himself his queen is still alive. At dawn, Skahaz Mokandak comes to speak with him. Skahaz is already aware that Quentin is dead, and he informs Barristan that the Green Grace, who Barristan sent to treat with the Yunkai to make them release the hostages, has not returned to the city. In addition, while the city is secure, an angry mob is gathered outside the pyramid demanding his daughter's release and that both dragons be destroyed. And since his arrest, the Sons of the Harpy have resumed their nightly murders with a vengeance. Barristan is shocked to learn that they have killed 29 in the night, in contrast to 9 the previous night and 3 the night before. However, despite Skaha's insistence, Barristan still refuses to kill the hostages in retaliation. The shave pate tells Barristan, who is now the Queen's Hand, as head of a council ruling the city, that the council is awaiting him. Barristan does not want that position, but in the absence of Daenerys, he doesn't trust any of the others to rule. Grey Worm, and the captains of the stalwart shields, mother's men, and free brothers, along with strong Belwas, are present. 
Barrison informs them of Quentin's death. Most of the council express contempt for the prince's action, and many want his companions, who are at present in prison, executing for unleashing the dragons on the city. The fighting pits are to remain closed for fear that the noise and smell of blood will attract the dragons, though Marslin suggests reopening the pits in the hopes it lures Drogon back and Daenerys with him. For the time being, the pits are packed full of livestock from which the dragons are feeding regularly, and thus far, there have been no further evidence of either Viserion or Rhaegal eating people. The council are convinced that the Yunkai are never going to accept any terms besides the killing of both dragons for the return of the hostages. When asked what he will do when his terms are refused, Barristan replies, fire and blood. They quickly grasp his meaning. He intends to do battle with the Yunkish army. A lengthy discussion regarding the battle plan follows particularly regarding the deployment of troops, targets to attack, how to best use the unsullied, and other such concerns. However, all agree that if they can destroy the slavers, the sellsword companies will abandon their paymasters and the dragons may make their presence known in the fight, though Barristan cannot say if they will help or just kill indiscriminately. Though he does know that if they come, it will break the Yunkish morale. When the council adjourns, Barristan goes to the cell where the two Dornishmen are being held and informs them of Prince Quentin's death. Garrus Drinkwater angrily blames Daenerys for it, causing a fierce argument between him and Barristan, who bluntly dismisses Garrus's claim, Quentin came for love, and asserts they came because Quentin's father wanted the backing of House Targaryen before daring to defy the Iron Throne. The Archibald Ironwood angrily tells Jairus to shut up before more can be said. Barristan then makes an arrangement with the two Dornishmen. In exchange for a ship back to Dorne and Quentin's bones to return to his father, Barristan wants them to go back to the Windblown Company and tell the Tattered Prince that they will give him what he wants, namely Pentos, if he can free and protect the hostages during the attack. The Green Grace returns, telling Barristan that the Yunkai have refused his offer and that the only price they will accept is the death of the dragons. As they speak, the Shafepate runs in and tells them that the six trebuchets have begun flinging, not rocks, but corpses into Marine. Daenerys is walking back south through the Dothraki Sea towards Marine, following a small rivulet that she thinks will flow into Skahazadan. She has spent her time flying Drogon, but could not make him take her back. Instead, they have been staying at his lair, a small cave in a hill she named Dragonstone, as a reference to the place where she was born. She gets sick on the way and has a number of hallucinations as she lies in the grass, bleeding and dying. These include a vision of Quaith, of Viserys Targaryen, and of Jorah Mormont, and seem to revolve around the idea of forgetting who she is. Finally, a single Dothraki scout approaches her, but does not see her. The scout freezes as Drogon approaches, and then flees. Daenerys calls out for Drogon as he flies over and mounts him. Drogon catches and devours a horse and Danny joins him. This is how Khal Jocko, former co of Khal Drogo, accompanied by 50 of his warriors, finds her. Lord Regent Kevin Lannister is hosting a small council meeting in the Red Keep's throne room. Neither Queen Marjorie nor Cersei are present, nor is Tommen, as Kevin thinks it's kinder to let him spend as much time as possible with his mother before her trial and possible execution. The Lord of Griffin's Roost, Ronnet Connington, stands before them, insisting that he is loyal to King Tommen 
and uninvolved with whoever claims to be his uncle John Connington and the Targaryen pretender he has brought with him, who have landed with the Golden Company in the Stormlands, attacking towns and villages as they march on Storm's End. Ronit begs to prove his loyalty in battle, but the new hand of the king, Mace Tyrell, refuses and orders Ronit kept in his quarters for the moment. In addition to sending the men-at-arms, Jaime sent to accompany Connaughton south, all former thugs of Gregor Clegane's to the Night's Watch. Kevin has begun to resent the demands of Mace Tyrell as Cersei did, but he realizes he cannot openly oppose them. Tyrell and his bannerman Randall Tarly have both brought armies to King's Landing, while the Lannisters' army are still in the Riverlands. Tyrell insists that he will deal with Connington and his boy after Marjorie's trial, but both he and Tarly show much reluctance about it. Kevin, however, chides them. Tyrell then asks why Tolman can't declare Marjorie's innocence without a trial, but Kevin insists that defying the faith will send them straight into the arms of Connington or Stannis Baratheon at a time when the Ironborn are attacking the western lands as well. Mace Tyrell retorts that Paxter Redwine will drive the Ironmen back and that Stannis has to face both Roose Bolton and the cold climate of the north. He also dismisses the threat John Connington and the exiles of the Golden Company pose, but Kevin is unsure. He still remembers when Ares appointed Connington to the role of Hand, and while Tywin Lannister's assessment of Connington as unsuitable for the post proved true after his failure to kill Robert Baratheon at the Battle of the Bells, Kevin believes age has surely made Connington wiser, more cautious, and more dangerous. The small council all agree that Connington and his pretender must be crushed, lest Daenerys Targaryen receive word and leave Marine to join forces with them. Pycel suggests that they buy off the Golden Company, but new master of coin, Harris Swift, dismisses this idea. Thanks to Cersei's economic mismanagement, the treasury is nearly empty. The Iron Bank of Bravo, still demanding its money, pledges for new loans from Mere receive no favorable response, and their hopes of replenishing the treasuries with the fabled wealth of Dragonstone following Sir Loris's capture of the island have proven in vain. Mace Tyrell reacts angrily to that, arguing that Loris searched the castle and found no trace of gold or gemstones, nor the fabled cachet of dragon eggs supposedly kept there. Kevin personally thinks that Loris didn't look very hard, given that he is a young man prone to rash judgment, even more so following his injuries, and the Valerian sorcery used to construct Dragonstone likely hides many secrets, but Kevin diffuses the argument by suggesting Stannis likely took everything of value with him when he fled. Kevin also suggests that Harris try Pentoshi Magister moneylenders, or else go to Bravos and deal with the bank in person. Next, business turns to the forthcoming trials. Kevin says that Cersei has chosen trial by battle, with Sir Robert Strong to represent her as her champion. Tyrell and Tarly express deep misgivings about the man, which Kevin shares as they have all heard rumors. Marin Trent says he has never seen Strong eat or drink, and Burris Blount claims to have never seen him use the privy. Kevin muses that dead men don't shit suspecting that he and the others know who Strong really is. However, Kevin silences Mace's protests by arguing that if Cersei loses her trial, the legitimacy of her children, and thus Marjorie's claim to the throne as Tolman's queen, will be called into question. He also assures the council that even if Cersei proves her innocence, she will be sent back to Casterly Rock afterwards, and play no further part in ruling or Tolman's education. The meeting adjourns, intending to reconvene in five days' time and leaving for later decisions about an inheritance involving House Rosby and six claims, as well as the preparation for Marcella's upcoming marriage. 
Mace Tyrell makes plain his scorn for the marriage, particularly after Marcella's injuries, and suggests a better match for her. Kevin muses that Mace likely has his son Willis in mind. He dismisses the idea, warning that reneging on Marcella's betrothal now could be all the cause Doran Martell needs to side with Connington. Harris Swift suggests that they get the Dornish to deal with Connington and his pretender. Kevin agrees that it would save them a lot of trouble. After Tyrell and Tali are gone, Pycel asks Kevin for guards, fearing that Mace Tyrell means to do him harm for his part in Cersei's claims about Marjorie, but Kevin dismisses his concern. It is snowing heavily in King's Landing, and Kevin retires to his study for time to warm up. He muses on the possibility of raising his son Lancel to the King's Guard to end his newfound piety before his thoughts turn to Cersei, the charming and sweet girl she once was. He believes that had Eris accepted Tywin's offer and wed his son to Cersei, Rhaegar would never have looked twice at Lyanna Stark and perhaps many now dead would still be alive. He thinks on Cersei's walk of shame and how similar it was to what Tywin did to their father's mistress, but Kevin reassures himself it was necessary. The faith had to be appeased and left unchecked, Cersei would have corrupted Tommen as she did Joffrey. Kevin then goes to Cersei's chambers where he has dinner with her and Tommen. Cersei is very calm and guarded after her walk of atonement, which Kevin thinks a good sign. She makes a humble request that Tyena Merriweather attend on her once more after the trial and that her son be brought to court as a companion for Tommen. She also asks after her brothers, but Kevin has no news of Jaime or Tyrion. He also says that he has imprisoned the remaining Kettle Black brothers for their crimes of fornicating with a queen. If they confess, he will send them to the wall. If not, they will face Robert Strong. A messenger then announces that Grand Maester Pycelle is asking for Kevin's presence. Kevin arrives at the Maester's chambers and enters to find a white raven sitting on the window's ledge a sign from the citadel that winter has come. Kevin turns to leave and is hit in the chest by a crossbow bolt. He calls out for help, but then sees Pycelle at his table already dead. For one moment, Kevin calls out to Tyrion, thinking his nephew responsible, but a familiar voice tells him otherwise as the real killer emerges, Varus. Varus explains to the dying Kevin that he bears the man no ill will, that Kevin is simply a good man in service to a bad cause, but he was becoming too successful in uniting the realm behind Tolman and undoing the damage Cersei had caused. The eunuch adds that Cersei will suspect the Tyrells with help from the imp. For Kevin's murder, the Tyrells will blame her Someone will blame the Dornish, and the alliance shoring up Tolman's hold on the Iron Throne will crumble as Aegon makes his presence known at Storm's End, and the realm flocks to the side of the Targaryens. Kevin insists that Aegon was killed during the sack of King's Landing, but Varys explains otherwise. That Aegon has been groomed since birth to be king, taught not just in skill at arms and ruling, but how to look after himself, what it means to go hungry, to be hunted, and most importantly, that it is his duty to rule, not his right, and to put his people first. Varus then summons some of his little birds and instructs them to finish the dying Kevin off. That's it, everyone. We've come to the end of this reread project. I want to thank everyone who has come by and listened to my videos. I thank you for all of your support and your kind words and even your constructive criticism. I didn't finish this reread project in the time that I had originally planned, but as you all know, sometimes life happens. Anyways, I hope that these videos have been an enjoyment for you. 
And anytime you want to come back and refresh your memory on any of these, any of the books or any of the chapters, these rereads will be here for you to come back and listen to. Once again, I just want to say thank you. Bye.